You're very welcome to the next episode in our Work From Anywhere series. Today, we're coming to you from the Business Travel Show in London, where I'm going to be sitting right beside Kieran Delaney. And we've also got virtually Tara Vastani and Dave Kearns. We're going to be talking about the Anywhere Office of the Future. I have to say, I was inspired recently by a post that Dave shared. It was around the evolution of the employees from past to present. Well worth a look, but really talking about some of the major changes that we're likely to see. I felt this infographic really captured it. We'll share that in the show notes. You can catch that on our website. And in our next episode in two weeks' time, we're going to be talking about diversity and inclusion with Lorraine Charles, Tarek Kulhusi, and Claire Kumar. So tune in then for now. Enjoy episode 13. Hi, everyone. We are here in the Good Hotel in London on the Hubley space that we booked, ready for the webinar. Hello everyone, you are very welcome to our Work From Anywhere series coming to you from London. I was like a little child getting into the plane there the day before yesterday coming over to London. Uh, it's just great to be back on those face-to-face -face, uh, side of things. As much as a little remote, it's great to meet people in person. Uh, so today's episode, the Anywhere Office of the Future. A couple of statistics came out in the last week or two. Just wanted to draw all your attention to. There's a very good survey by the World Economic Forum. By the way, we'll share all these resources and any resources that are mentioned during the webinar uh, in the show notes that we have on our website. First one, so work for World Economic Forum. Two-thirds of people around the world want to work flexibly when the COVID pandemic is over. Almost a third are prepared to quit their job if the boss makes them go back to the office full time. And this survey of workers in 29 nations also shows people have coped better with homeworking than some had feared. So this is gonna come as no surprise to many of you. We talk a lot about these statistics. The other one as well is a really good Twitter thread by Chris Hurd and just so many stats, I'm not gonna reel them all off, but one of the ones that jumped out is that 45% of Americans would either quit their job immediately to start a remote work job search if they were forced to return to the office full time. So look, there's plenty of stats to go around, but I think today's episode about the Anywhere Office of the Future, we're very excited by. So why don't we just bring on our wonderful panel, uh, bring on Dave and Tara and Kieran. Uh, great to have you all on board today. Thank you very much for being part of this. Thanks for having us. Great. Great well, to join you, John. Great. Well, maybe Kieran, do you want to kick us off? Tell us uh, more about yourself and, and your own background and hopefully and everything. Yeah, sure. So yeah, Kieran Delaney, a nice uh, complicated Irish name. Um, yeah, I'm the founder of Hubly, and Hubly is a platform that allows companies really to empower employees to succeed from anywhere. So we've we've 185,000 spaces now on on Hubly that people can book for meetings, workspaces, and even group accommodation and offsites. So yeah, so great to join you, John, and have a chat about what we do and learn from the guys as well. Super, and Tara, you've been busy. You were just on, I was tuning into the Running Remote uh, Ask Me Anything webinar as well, covering everything around employment law and beyond. So we're excited to get you on today. Tell us more about yourself and Remote Law Canada. Thank you so much, John. So yeah, I've just uh, gotten off the Ask Me Anything series at Running Remote. Everyone, my name is Tara Vazdani. I'm the principal lawyer and founder at Remote Law Canada. I became increasingly interested in remote work about three to four years ago. Um, so the, the metric I like to use is pre-COVID. Um, as an employment lawyer, I was fascinated with how employment laws would treat nomads in particular that were working in different jurisdictions, but for employers that were also in different jurisdictions from where they were. Um, that slowly developed into a passion for flexible workplaces and particularly remote work and how employment laws and health and safety legislation dealt with uh, those types of workers. Mm -hmm. Today, we advise employees and employers really all over the globe, but, you know, with, uh, with our home base being in Canada on how employment laws impact their relationships with their independent contractor, freelancer or employee remote workers. Yeah, well, absolutely. I like that. You find that people uh, who have an expertise in employment law and remote working and the intersection of those two are as rare as hen's teeth that we would say in, <laughs> in Ireland. I know the only other one I would know would be the likes of Bagashari Panchali. She's great as well, but you're a rare beast in the world of remote work. So it's great to have you on. Uh, Dave, tell us all about yourself. You are, you've got a great presence on LinkedIn and a great thought leader in the world of, uh, of uh, property and remote, uh, remote work and beyond. Uh, tell us more about yourself. What's your passion? What got you? into all this 
Yeah, for sure. Well, firstly, that was literally the best and most high production value introduction to a webinar that I have ever been part of. <laughs> I was jamming to the tunes on the way in. Yeah, I love it. So anyway, awesome, awesome job. And I'm really so happy to be here with you, John. You've just been such a great um, supporter of mine the last little while. So yeah, I'm Dave. Uh, I'm an office leasing agent from downtown Toronto. Uh, really simple terms. I help big and small companies rent office space and increasingly confusing continuum of what that looks like. Some of it looks like Hubbly. I think a lot of the future actually looks a lot more like Hubbly than uh, some of the traditional real estate transactions that I'm doing right now. Um, I have a really different lens, I guess, for uh, the nature of using an office. Uh, I grew up as an online poker player. I grew up in a digital first arena. I learned how to build and maintain asynchronous and digital relationships, remote relationships. I learned how to collaborate in that way and really being in person was kind of secondary to that that world that I predominantly lived in. Um, and it just really has not informed a very different perspective for me on uh, on how to rent office space. And, and the pandemic has just, you know, opened my mind wide open. I've been basically publicly journaling my thoughts for two years, mm -hmm. and they very much have been evolving, as, uh, as I'm sure many would uh, agree. Um, and I think how I would summarize generally how I feel about office space is right now I'm sitting in a co working space. I'm 10 minutes from my home walking distance. I'm 15 minutes walking to my daughter's daycare. I'm wearing slippers <laughs> and I will never be going back to the financial district five days a week ever, ever, ever again. And if somebody tried to tell me to do that, I would quit. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's hitting the nail on the head. There was a funny story. I was at the uh, Business Travel Show earlier and somebody shared a story of, it was a big conference. I think it was like the Web Summit in Portugal. And one of the guest speakers, I think, was uh, used to be an advisor in the old White House. And uh, they basically were wearing a business suit, everything good to go, uh, tie the whole lot. And uh, during the, the middle of a keynote presentation, they stood up and like they stood up and all they were wearing was like their, their jocks. Like that was about it. <laughs> yeah. So I think at least we're, we're, we're a bit better clothed now uh, today. But I'd like to ask you all, you know, you're, you're a great mix of people from on the one hand, the, you know, with Hubbly and the co-working side of it, for example, and obviously Tara, you know, figuring out the how and on the, the legal side, for example, also critical, doesn't fall through. And Dave, just, I think, I like how you're thinking through the future of all this, uh, connecting the different dots. Um, I suppose a question I have for you, and, and read this, because there's no right or wrong answer to this, but uh, one of the statements that we put to the, uh, uh, the, uh, the panelists a couple of weeks ago, who were also very big in real estate, is work, work is not a place. And the answer, uh, the question is yes or no. Is work a place or not? How do you define that? So maybe, Kieran, you want to kick us off on that? Yeah, I think that, you know, it's what you want it to be. I think that's where we found ourselves now, right? That we're, we all kind of work where we want to work, as, as in many cases. And I think the employees are getting used to that, right? They're getting used to have that sort of freedom and being able to manage your day, manage your diary, you know, work when you need to you know, juggle the kind of family life in some situations as well, less commuting. So I think suddenly now there's much more freedom and you get to kind of decide how to work and where you want to work. And that's the probably the challenge, isn't it? That's kind of how we've evolved in many cases as employees. And listen, you know, you mentioned some stats at the beginning, John, right? There's constant reports now coming out that, you know, people want that freedom. They're going to move jobs if suddenly they're forced back to offices. And so I think the challenge is really trying to figure that out if you're in a, in a large organization. Right. I get and you. You wanna... and by the anyone in the audience as well, please feel free to share any comments. If you have any questions or challenges or ideas or particularly if you have any tools you want to share as well, please feel free to jump in uh, on the comments or even just share with us where you are in the world. Uh, Tara, how do you see that? I mean, work is not a place, I guess, from an employment law perspective, yeah. it most definitely is. Or how do you see that? On the one hand, you know, the employment law structures around the world built on having a contract with one fixed location, whereas now you have this world that's shifting where it's no longer that office space i used to go to it could be just like dave said where you're 15 minutes from you know a kid's daycare 10 minutes from home where you're actually nowhere near the original office that was in your contract so excellent question and you know i've got my employment law hat on which i always have so work is not a place is <laughs> let me give the lawyer answer it depends so really <laughs> when you're thinking from an employment law perspective there's so many factors at play where is the work actually be, being completed? So, you know, a great example is, is Quebec. Their employment legislation states that the employment laws that govern the employment relationship relate to where the employee is domiciled 
and not where the employer is. So Quebec perceives the work being completed as where the employee is physically located. On the other hand, many employers that are hiring nomads or remote workers that are working outside of their jurisdiction consider the work to be completed where the employer is located and where the end product is. So work is definitely not a place. I think that it's absolutely possible to hire nomads, to hire freelancers, and to hire even employees in different jurisdictions. How the employment legislation deals with that and how certain tax liabilities deal with that and how certain health and safety legislation deals with that is a uh, very subjective. So of course, yeah. do I think that it's a relationship that's absolutely possible and that can be achieved? A hundred percent. And I just finished up an entire webinar on all of the legal and compliance issues that deal with uh, that deal with remote work and nomads. And so work is absolutely not a place. And if the correct employment laws are implemented, then, you know, you can absolutely work from anywhere. Well, speaking of which, I'm seeing somebody barefoot in split. Very, very jealous. Uh, <laughs> tell me, uh, you know, Dave, the work is not a place. Tell me what that looks like if you are, you know, a gray haired 60 year old who works in commercial real estate with a heavy real estate portfolio. I guess yeah. for you, work definitely is a place. Yeah. Who wants to be that? <laughs> <laughs> putting up the kind of worms here. <laughs> um, so I made a post yesterday and I said the past equal the office equals the destination, the future, the work equals the destination. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is really informative to the changing nature of the office landscape. So I'll, I'll bring up a couple of examples. And um, Kate, how do I say your name again, man? For God's sake, I always mess Me. up. But yeah, what I'm about to go Kieran, and say, Kieran. Kieran, I always screw yeah. it up. So I'm Kieran, I'm not going to mention your company in this example, but you are part of this story in a huge way. So I just want to cool. say that in advance. Wow. Um, so let's look at a couple things that have happened like in the last six months, okay? The US government awarded a contract to um, Liquid Space, WeWork, Expansive, DeskPass, and one other player I'm thinking. And the intent behind that initiative was to allow for their employees to have work come to them, not to them necessarily go to work. In other words, they're giving the employee the opportunity to pick up their phone and decide where they want to work that day. That might be home and it might be a wide variety of other places. It could be the hotel that you guys are sitting in right now. It could be a co-working space like the one I'm in. It could be the HQ of the organization. It could be a client site. There's a million different places that people need and desire to work. But I think that we haven't really been leaning into facilitating that from both the supply and the technology point of view. And that example to me is really, really demonstrative of where things are headed. Uh, another example, CBRE invested 40% uh, in Industrious at the beginning of the pandemic. They had their own flex office space platform and they elected to let that one get rolled into Industrious and focus on the growth of that, that company. So to me, that says two things. One, it's not easy to actually be a really, really great space as a service operator. And two, it's a major checkmark and validation for the growth of the space as a service or flex office sector. All the brokerages are aligned in one way or another that that's going to represent something like 15 to 30 percent of inventory by 2030. And I think wow. that that is like potentially very, very conservative in light of what has been going on re lately. But I do encourage my colleagues, if any of them are listening, to get out of our own way and find ways to shift the nature of the supply because demand is showing us very clearly that they desire something different than what we offer. That's another one. And then the last one I'll, I'll mention, and there are many of these examples, but State Street elected to get rid of their downtown New York City headquarters completely. And they're going to be allowing for their employees to work in co-working spaces and then also tap into some of their um, regional offices. So that to me is really, really demonstrative again of change. And clearly the future of real estate is flexible from a real estate standpoint. And that's being driven by the individuals and the employees standpoint of what they are desiring. So to me, the future of work equals the future of commercial real estate. And maybe a follow-up question for all three. Maybe Dave, as you're on the point, I mean, what, what was that inflection? When, when did you realize that there was something big going on here, that this was a, a, an inflection point for real estate, that, you know, that the offices and how we see them were, were fundamentally changed? Is that something you already saw pre-pandemic or was yeah. there a particular point where you saw, hold on a second, during the pandemic, it is just going to completely change? Yeah, I had this like light bulb moment uh, in October of 2019. 
Uh, I was working with one of the largest technology companies in the world. And I'm sorry if I have some background noise here from outside, but um, I was working with one of the largest technology companies in the world. They have 100,000 square feet in Toronto, and they were looking to add another 80,000 square feet for anticipated growth. But they came to us, they said, look, we really only have visibility on needing another 15,000 square feet of space, but we think and kind of hope because we want our business to grow that we'll need 80. How can we be more creative about like structuring a transaction that doesn't have us paying rent mm -hmm. on 65,000 square feet of space we don't need when we only need 15. So what we did is we brought in different flex space operators at the outset and essentially ran an RFP process whereby we then went with that tenant or company and the flex space operator in tow to landlords and saying, hey, like we want to structure a deal with you that allows for us to lease whatever portions of the space we want traditionally on five to 10 year terms. But we also want to find a creative solution to bring in this third party operator to help us facilitate renting space as and when we need it, right? Mm. And of course, the, the landlords were open to this structure because the company was willing to basically financially uh, protect that lease obligation, regardless of whether they were using the space or not. But that was so illuminating to me because I saw a company through a broker trying to solve their own flexibility problems. And what I asked myself at the time is I said, how long are companies going to actually put up with this? Like mm. their suppliers are not offering them what they want. And so that moment was it for me. I, I, I just, that's when I moved in a different direction with my thinking. Well, that, that ties in really strongly with the webinar we had a couple of weeks ago. I think it was Nick Levine. He was saying how even pre- I think John might have cut out. I don't know if you guys can. He's frozen. David, you're on mute. Yeah, I think Kieran also is frozen because they're both in the same space. Um, ah. So it might be just a Wi-Fi issue for both of them. So we can keep going. I mean, when is the first? When did I have the first indication that this uh, this big movement was happening? Um, I was watching an Economist documentary, and it was about this digital nomad couple, and they were jumping around from country to country, month by month, uh, and working. Oh, no, we lost them. Looks They'll like come back. They'll come back. Keep show going. Now, guys. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we're your new hosts. And uh, so pretty much I, I saw these these nomad couples. And the first thing I did is I called my now fiance and I said, well, like, how do we do this? I, I want to work like that. I want to live in different countries. And then you know, I took it a step further and I thought, uh, okay, we've got Kieran. Excellent. I'm um, back. Kieran, we're, we're running the show for a little bit here. So, Good. you know, I was just explaining uh, when, when this kind of aha moment came to me uh, with remote yeah. work. And really it was, I want to say late 2018, I was watching uh, a documentary about a digital nomad couple. And I started to think, if the couple is living in different jurisdictions at a given time, how are not just uh, the employment laws dealt with and who governs the employment relationship, but I actually took it a step further and I thought about, you know, what if the services are provided from a certain country to a certain country, and neither of those countries are the jurisdiction of the employer, what, what laws apply, um, how are taxation issues dealt with, how is intellectual property dealt with? Et cetera, et cetera, privacy laws. Um, and I ended up writing an article for Canadian lawyer that was titled The Legal Issues That Arise for the Legal Issues Affecting Digital Nomads. And from there, it was just this spiral. I introduced the article on LinkedIn, and all of a sudden, all of these thought leaders in the remote work and digital nomad space were liking the article. Very quickly, I connected with tons of them, just like both of you. And eventually it ended up that uh, a Forbes article was written on the legal issues uh, affecting remote work. John, here you are. Apologies, guys. Where the, what, just the internet just went to me for about uh, two minutes. Apologies. I'm Same back. Here. Uh, Same here. Yeah. We've Sorry. been running the show, man. It's all good. You've been, you guys yeah. have been running the show, I should <laughs> say. Not me. In. Good, 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 good to hear. Well, thank you for thank you for co-hosting uh, temporarily. Um, so I, I guess uh, okay. If we take a look at Remote Law Canada, then Tara, uh, can you tell us like some of the challenges that you your clients are facing or 
kind of what's causing them to pull their hair out now with this transition to remote work? So great question. Um, and, you know, it, it really, I think that one of the key elements here is that employers often think that the remote work landscape is scary from a legal perspective. And so they try to prevent it or they try to make it a hybrid model and try to shy away from the fully remote or fully flexible model. Um, probably the largest concerns with employers right now that are running distributed teams are twofold. So first and foremost, is the relationship in fact an independent contractor or employee relationship? And will the employer be in some sort of trouble if it's interpreted otherwise to the way that they've implemented it? Um, and tax liabilities. So when an employer is hiring an employee outside of their jurisdiction, so whether that's you know in, in Canada, provincially we're regulated, uh, our, our employment laws are provincial. So an employer that is hiring somebody in a different province seriously has to think about which employment laws apply. Um, or to take it a step further, if a Canadian employer or US employer is hiring an employee in the, uh, in the EU or is hiring an employee in South America, they really have to begin to think about whether or not they're going to be engaging in an employer-employee relationship or an independent contractor relationship. Oftentimes, they choose to uh, engage them as freelancers or independent contractors. The worry that comes with that for most employers is that the courts do not uh, really uh, consider whether or not that relationship exists based on the document that's exchanged between the two parties. So you can have an agreement that says this is an independent contractor relationship. This is the way that we've uh, decided it's going to go forward. The test in Canada and throughout the globe is different. It doesn't matter what the agreement says. It matters how the relationship is actually functioning. So who provides the tools uh, to complete the work? Who sets the hours of work? Who has the ability to hire and fire? Who bears the chance of profit or the risk of loss, et cetera? And so those factors are indicative of an independent contractor employee relationship. And I would say that that's probably the largest concern for mm. my employer clients right now that are hiring nomads or hiring remote workers outside of their that's jurisdiction. A, that's a good one. So we've, so we've also seen that as well. That one of the big challenges is that companies think, oh, let's just hire them as a contractor. We don't have a legal entity in that country. Hire them as a contractor. Problem solved. Absolutely not. You've got contractor misclassification. Blow up in their face. I've heard of stories of companies that hire somebody as a contractor. They end up getting COVID. They end up suing the company because they ended up in hospital for three or four months. So a yeah, massive risk. Safety. And, Wow. Health and safety, yeah, exactly. Or for example, IR35 is another big one in the UK, which comes up as a big issue from that perspective. That's very interesting. And how about, uh, let's say, uh, if you take, for example, um, yourself, Dave, like what are the things that are keeping your clients up at night, causing them to tear their hair out? They don't know how to actually operate a hybrid workplace <laughs> <laughs> in simple terms. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that a lot are also very, very nervous to lead the pack with any meaningful change. Um, so I, I wrote in an article recently uh, entitled, What's the Cure to the Workplace Pandemic? Um, I gave a quote from a guy named Pontus Kilman in, in uh, Finland, and he referenced um, speedboats, cruise ships, and yachts and cruise ships, right, as sort of three ways of categorizing a company and how they might actually make decisions in light of an inflection point like this, right? And I think it's really critical to follow the speedboats because they can turn and maneuver far more easily and they may be more representative of the future. Although it is very interesting to see the largest occupier of office space, the US government, I believe they've got 700 million square feet or more, making a decision that they did to partner up with the likes of uh, marketplaces and, uh, and flex space operators um, mm -hmm. to bring work to people. So, um, you know, in general, I think most companies have been sitting on their hands, unfortunately, not really doing too much to change things. But as I've been talking about a lot, a lot about real estate, what I've been noticing recently, actually, is that there are issues that are far greater than real estate that may not have employees coming back into the workplace. One example that has come up numerous times for me lately has been dress code. I've talked to several employees of various organizations who work for corporate companies, and they've been in the office periodically and they have not been wearing a suit and they've been made to feel judged for that and maybe even worse. And I've had several people say things to me like, you know, this feels like a divisive culture to me. Mm. I'm different. I want to be more representative of my actual self. And if I feel I can't be myself in the workplace, I don't really want to come in. 
So, you know, even if we look at, let's say, examples like Apple pushing their, their date back, I'm, I'm not naive or, or insensitive to the fact that the Delta variant is raging through lots of parts of the world. Mm -hmm. But let's also ask ourselves the question, are they potentially now trying to figure out how to actually offer what their employees want? Because there was a revolt at Apple. I couldn't even believe it. There yeah. were, they, they offered their, their employees Mondays, Tuesdays and Thursdays in the office, where previously most of them were probably in there five days a week. You would think that's a massive win, right? But people were revolting because what we've all recognized is that our, our lives are very fluid. We have so many different obligations and personal needs that we need to meet. And what people are actually wanting is the trust and safety to actually to make a decision that's best for them and the collective at the same time. And I think so there's a lot of organizations that just don't have the ability to wrap their head around that. Those, those. Absolutely. And one of the things that we hear again and again and again, you're really starting to see it come to light now that this kind of back to office in a lot of places around the world is that, you know, in a in, in a, any kind of a company, you have a choice between three models. You've either be 100% remote or, you know, 100% in office, or you can do hybrid. But the problem is within hybrid, you have still have to have a strong bias for one or the other. If you're strong in the office and you have a strong bias for synchronous meetings, communication, meeting in person, that's fine. If that's your key differentiator, it's a big part of your culture, go for it. But if you're, let's say, hybrid and you say you want to do remote and you have a bias for remote, then you need to go fully towards that, towards asynchronous communication. The written word becomes much more important. The idea of trust becomes much more important as well. But for a lot of companies, I think, is they're doing a halfway house. They're saying like, oh, three days in the office, two days at home or vice versa. But they're not figuring out what does that mean for the company culture and the tooling and how we communicate and just all that those aspects of it. I think a lot of companies are kind of going to run into a bit yeah. of a messy kind of a come back to office, let's say. Uh, you're right. Can I add one thing? Because you've, you've just prompted me to be inspired. So like we think of office space in a far too binary way. Like I'm working in an office space right now, but there's a lot of employers out there that would say, get your ass back downtown, right? I'm in an office. I'm doing work. <laughs> I'm performing my job, right? We need to acknowledge that this there's just a location, location, location is being redefined. And that is very indicative of the growth of businesses like Hubley. So with that, I will pass the mic. Exactly. Back. So it's uh, one of the questions <laughs> on that. And I'd like you maybe uh, tying into that, Kieran, if you can tell us more yeah. about the launch of Hubley and about that. But also the question I see from Francine, she had a question from the panel. What do you think the collaborative spaces of the future will look like? And I've heard of new collaboration spaces being created at HQs that are already being used. So tell us about the launch of Hubley and how kind of you see the future of collaboration spaces and what that looks like. Yeah, listen, look, we started life really as a, within the business travel world right so we were helping global companies to empower employees to you know book flexible spaces but around business travel has been the core kind of driver for that right so we work with companies like bp right and they have ten thousand employees that have access to their own version of hubly right so by doing that like that process we started to understand what big organizations need to sort of manage this area, right? So with relations with BP and a lot of other corporates like that, we, you know, we built in the tools that companies need, right? They need to be able to decide, you know, how do people access a platform, right? So it's all well and good saying, let's give, let's get a technology. But if you've got thousands of employees, that's not a simple, straightforward process, right? So we connect into Workday and a single sign on. So simple things like that make it a lot easier for big organizations to say, okay, we can actually give 2,000 employees access to this system in a seamless way that makes it easy for them. So does, does, from that experience, John, we kind, of, we, chat, we kind of overcame a lot of the challenges for you know, giving employees access to, to a platform to book uh, flexible spaces for, for meetings, workspaces, and, and even off sites. And there's loads of complications. It's not easy, right? Well, access what, what are those point. challenges? I mean, that's one of the things I'm really curious to dive into. That for. Like, what yeah. are the challenges moving from a hybrid to, let's say, involving co locations? Like, what are the challenges and, and the benefits? I'm really curious to hear those. Yeah. So, the first thing is understanding what you need, right, as an organization, mm -hmm. right? So, we actually we're quite consultative in that respect and share a lot of data and kind of help an organization figure it out. A good example is a new client of ours. They have 20,000 employees, right? And by talking to them, they kind of said, you know what, we want to give 3,000 employees access to book flexible spaces because we figured out that they live more than 40 kilometers from one of our offices, right? So that was one decision. Okay. And then it's like, well, who, you know, so that's the who. And who do you give access to is important, right? Like, you've, depending on your organization size, 
it's all well and good. Apple, like they have a lot of employees, they have a lot of offices. So you need to figure out the who part, right? Who does this apply to? Who's who's most in need for a solution? Um, we're dealing with you know business travel directors and now increasingly real estate directors and companies, but they're in procurement, right? And procurement's about money. So who pays for it? How much does it cost? And how can you save and drive savings? That's massive. That's a big area. We all love talking about innovation. We love talking about, you know, work from anywhere, but big organizations care about money. They care about how much they spend, right? So we literally give companies like reports and data around how much it costs for workspaces, meetings globally. So that data is really helpful because they can actually crunch the numbers and say, wait a second, this makes sense. Who pays is a big factor as well, John, right? We have a, we have a, a client and they decided the company's going to pay, you know, from a centrally. So you can obviously have it that sometimes people expense, et cetera, but they said, no, we're going to pay for it centrally. Um, so what we did is we built in a payment function that all their all their bookings, so their employees can go in and book meetings, workspaces, off sites. It's all charged centrally. And they get one statement at the end of the month and they have 60 days to pay for all those bookings. And this company is probably booking, it's probably a thousand bookings a month in now in COVID, right? So they're, you know, so that's a big one, right? You're in procurement, how do we, so there's lots of those things that we don't think about, but if you're sitting as a procurement person, real estate or business travel, you need to figure out. And then obviously relationships with spaces, inventory, ease of use. You know, we're sitting in a hotel beside the, the convention here in London. I booked that on Hubley. It took me five minutes, right? I went into Hubley, booked it, paid with a credit card, got an email convert, uh, confirmation, sent you a link with all the information. That's that's what we need, right? The days of having to send 20 emails and like that on demand is is where the future is. And it's it's here, you know, we're doing it, a lot of other platforms are doing it and it's rapidly scaling because that's how we live, right? That's yeah, how we, you know, we're all booking our taxis, our takeaway, everything is on on your phone. So that but that's I, vital because you can't bog down employees. You know, you can't give give them a solution that's full of, steps and manual yeah. and slow. needs to be easy um, needs to be easy to implement yeah. but it, you, you, you've hit something really powerful there because you know for me the big i'm mean, putting the cfo hat on the biggest yeah. thing that's happening here is we're taking you know a cost which is a fixed cost real estate it's been you know one of the biggest costs you know on any balance sheet even if you lease you know even if you lease that particular real estate on a monthly basis or in a 20 year lease, it's still, you know, the leases as a, as a financial obligation, they're gonna come onto your balance sheet one way or the other, typically. But now if you turn that around, you say, hold on a second, we're gonna take a chunk of that and put it into co-working spaces. All of a sudden you're taking a fixed cost and you're variabilizing it, which is, you know, that's massive. That's absolutely massive. It's giving a lot more flexibility for these companies to take a bunch of capital that was sucked in to real estate and now very uh, deploy it somewhere else into training people or whatnot. Uh, which is a yeah. fascinating. Um, and uh, also, the, John, you're, oh, jump, you're yeah, paying for. Sorry. You go ahead. Uh, I was going to uh, say you're paying for it when you need it. Yeah. Right. That's the beauty, right? So, and it's also it can be. Like we're book. We book this room. We, we're paying for it for three hours, right? We're not, you know. So that's it. So you're only paying on demand when you need it, and that's yeah. the big difference with the flexibility. And obviously, when you when you've other costs that are fixed on a monthly basis. It's less flex, but you can't turn it on and off. And that's probably yeah. where, yeah, flexible space okay. is really, Dave, do you want really to jump in there? Well, well it's like well. so in line with actually where I was going to go with it. Um, so I'm I'm in a co-working space right now. I have the flexibility of a one-year lease. It actually expires today. I got to like move this couch. Where is it? I got to move this couch out of this place later today. Um, anyway, um, but I'm like kicking myself actually, even within a one-year lease, because there's been so many days through the pandemic that I haven't been able to be here. It's been amazing for me to have this space. I'm so grateful that I've had it, but the utilization is awful. And here I am talking to people every day about how they need to utilize space better. And I'm currently utilizing it like dog shit. And <laughs> I love it. Human nature. It's, it's absolutely human nature, right? Mm. So yeah. you have to like, yeah. there's a reset that needs to happen for organizations to start thinking about purchasing decisions in more on-demand ways. I've learned my lesson this time. I'm not ever going to be renting an office like this for myself ever again because the needs of my day are just so fluid. So companies need to figure it out. But the really, really scary part and the part that's like 
a tectonic shift that I hope happens one day is the nature of the supply changing is just really, really tough because this turns an asset management business into a hands-on like, you know, hotel style business. If this is actually how you're operating your buildings, right? And uh, Kieran, I don't know how much of your portfolio falls in an office building versus a hotel, but clearly hotels are already like from a mindset point of view, more their business is set up to sell something by the hour. Whereas traditional yeah. real estate landlords are not in any way equipped on every level to do things that way. Sort of. I think we're like, we probably 48% of our bookings go to hotels. And, and the rest is to huge range, like Industrious are on Hubley, you know, Regis, we're one of the biggest online channels for Regis globally. So yeah, you're right, listen, and, and ironically, hotels are the last to sell spaces on an hourly basis. So the newer, like Industrious and those guys are much more innovative and mm. they tend to start doing that much earlier. But you're, you're one person, Dave, right? So you just gave a great example, one person, you're underutilizing your space. Imagine a company who has like an office space for 500 people or, or a thousand people. That's scary. And similar and situation. It's so scary. Yeah. The knock on effects too, right? Like they go build out that space. They ruin the environment doing it, building it up, tearing it down. Like there's mm. just so many knock on effects. You see, speaking of, of knock on effects, one of the ones that's jumping out at me here is, I mean, and I'd like to your thoughts on this, Tara, is I'm, I'm sensing a whole bunch of commercial leases are going to go into dispute. It's going to be yeah. a bit of a nightmare. I mean, it, are you sensing that as well? I mean, I, I can just see so, COVID triggering all, all these different things, <laughs> triggering a, you know dispute clauses and leases. So let me touch on this from a few perspectives. First and foremost, I want to touch on this Regis aspect, Kiran, because uh, we use Regis. And I can tell you one utility of that model that I think uh, employers or, I guess, thought leaders in this space tend not to consider is at least from my perspective, clients themselves have so enjoyed the ability to meet with me in an office space that is close to where they are located. I'm in Oakville now. I used to be in Toronto. I have met with clients in Markham, Hamilton, um, Brantford, and Regis offers that capability. So from a client service perspective, it's fantastic. Now to ask your question, John, there's so many elements at play and I'm listening to you all speak and you know, I'm so excited to give my perspective. So from a commercial lease perspective, obviously a lot of these companies are locked into leases. How do you deal with that? First and foremost, you can deal with the penalties of breaking the lease. A simpler solution would be to adopt a model that's similar to Regis, you know, reduce your office footprint by, for example, creating shared office spaces, potentially instead of breaking the lease, subleasing a portion of that lease to another tenant. Most commercial leases provide uh, sublease clauses because of um, the likelihood that some businesses may go out of business. So subleasing, assigning the lease. Um, but I think the, the more important factor is really taking advantage of some of these hybrid or flexible workspaces where all of a sudden you're getting rid of these individual office spaces, creating a shared office system, a booking, an online booking system, um, retaining meeting spaces and then leasing off potentially even some of the other areas to some of your subcontractors, some of your clients, some of your larger clients. Um, that's the way to deal with the commercial lease. Now, if you were going to be able to get out of that lease, one thing that you really have to consider is how you're meeting certain health and safety requirements when employees are working from home or when they are working from co-working spaces. If an employee has a trip and fall, or if the space is not ergonomically sound, all of a sudden you're dealing with a short-term disability claim. All of a sudden you're dealing with a violation of uh, Ontario Health and Safety Act or you know the, the similar legislation in whatever jurisdiction you're in. Those are important considerations. One of the ways that we get around that is in all of our employment agreements and all of our independent contractor agreements and all of our remote work policies, we include a health and safety checklist. The health and safety checklist asks the employee to take photos of the space. It asks them questions about how private and confidential the space is. Does it have lockable doors and windows? Is it free and clear of trip hazards? So that one was an important one when kids were home during the COVID-19 pandemic, because all of a sudden you've got toys on the floor. You trip and fall, you're technically in the course of work. Does it fall? A, does it become a WSIB claim? Does it become an OSHA claim? Does it become a short-term disability claim? 
So those are some of the protections that you need to think about when you're transitioning mm -hmm. the real estate footprint of your of your space, whether it's they're going to be working from home, they're going to be working from a COVID space. Um, I'm sorry, a co-working space, a COVID space. Uh, I've been talking on this all morning. And so you know, really, <laughs> no, really I, interesting, like really powerful yeah. points, Sarah. Yeah. And so when, well, can when I, I can I jump in? Sure, sure. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. By no, go me. ahead. Sorry. I was going to say to you, though, on the safety piece that in a way, what you're saying is 100 percent valid, but a technology can also help to drive uh, efficiency with that. Right. So here's a good example. BP have a very stringent health and safety protocols. Right. For if you're in a venue, they have a list of information the venue has to comply with. So what we did with them was we said, great, give us the list. We'll build it into Hubley. And when someone books, the venue will complete that. Amazing. So now, what, now we have that here now. Actually, it's a question from Brent. He's like, uh, does the uh, solutions like Hubley offer like workplace safety standards, as in like uh, COVID safety standards, things like that, which I think it does, for example. Yeah. I think that will be uh, a no-brainer for all the flex workplaces, I'm guessing, you know? Yeah, that is, that's kind of, that's a, yeah. So with this example, it's actually like BP have now six and a half thousand venues around the world that have complied to their specific health and safety requirements. Mm. So it's like all of a sudden that's a problem. And now a technology can just help me solve it, right? Roll it out. Also, they've got security data, security alerts, and a whole team that build these security information for different cities. We have that API into their instance of Hubley as well. So suddenly it's like all of a, it's, a, it's a safety and security enabler for them, right? And helps them kind of, the point of that uh, Brent mentioned there, yeah, venues add their policies to it. Um, and just on Francine's question earlier on, John, what we're doing now is we're seeing that companies are saying, you know, we have, we've spent a lot of money reorganizing our central office, right? We've got these little meeting hubs, we've got this innovation area and they're, they're, they love us, right? And what we're doing now is saying, great, let's bring that into Hubley. So when your employees search for New York, they can actually book your own office space Absolutely. and your own meeting space, yeah. right? So that's sort of what's happening more and more now in relation to Francine's question, just about Very, the, good, the good, innovation good. hubs. Good to have them. And by the way, Adi, please feel free to jump in on any more questions. Although I, I, there's a couple more questions I had on my on my list to get through. One of them is a, a solution that just blew my mind, uh, Dave. You shared it a couple of weeks ago. Laser Technologies, tell me more about this crowd. Yeah. Well, I mean, I know a little bit about them. Tara, maybe you do too. Um, they are a company that um, started themselves off in a in a innovation hub slash co-working space in Toronto called 111, which is an amazing a place for software as a service companies. Um, and it's just really interesting to see that the pandemic has had them completely ditch even a flexible office strategy. And they've gone to pure remote first with, um, I believe, four times a year, they're going to be renting an office for the month in a different location around the world. I think it's just really cool. And again, a leading indicator of a wide variety of those types of, you know, arrangements that are likely to, to be part of the future. I even think Chris Hurd was cited in the, in the New Yorker recently talking about potentially work hotels becoming more of a, like a, of a concept. Um, but I think the only thing to point out about that example is that I would reason to guess, and I kind of know from personal experience that their team is clearly a lot younger on average. And mm -hmm. I just question how well that type of, of, a, of an arrangement would work for the average company. So when I think of like working from anywhere and like, you know, I know Bagyashri and Tara, like I call you guys like the Grim Reapers of, of working from anywhere, <laughs> like lawyers, you just find a way to like, you know, bring reality to the equation. But so from that point of view, what I really think working from anywhere needs to be more like on the whole considered from is what I will call like, you know, regional, or greater city area working from anywhere. That I think is far more attainable for the average organization in the near term. But when I think of the future, like I made a post again, this is part of my other post. It was like 30 year career starting in 1990, 6,500 days in the office, 10,950 days on earth, right? 30 year career starting in 2022, definitely not 6,500 days in a conventional headquarter office, mm -hmm. right? That's not the future. Oh. So. 
Do I think that the future is a future of office-based work? I don't. Do, do I think that offices are a very fundamental part of the future of knowledge work? Yes. But it, like it, they are not, like offices are not the future of work. So on, on that, I find that fascinating. We, I was speaking at a global mobility conference uh, yesterday in London and the uh, global mobility leaders, they're, they're all saying that anyone who's coming in and a new role, for example, that they're hiring <coughs> is requesting some amount of work from anywhere. Most people are requesting some element of it, even if it's four or six weeks or, or even longer. Uh, but then against that, you've got obviously Tara talked about, for example, the employment law challenges, but there's also the taxation challenge of permanent establishment. So, you know, work from anywhere, it, it certainly is doable, but you could be very targeted at the countries you operate in, ideally have a legal entity. And against that, then you've got to watch to, you know, some of the key risks to on the taxation of employment law and, and other sides of it as well that we mentioned. Um, I think it, looking at that, then uh, I'm trying to think, it's, uh, I'm looking at one of the questions here, what does it take to get remote work right from a compliance and employment law perspective? When I say like remote work, a particular work from anywhere, are you seeing many companies request that, for example, what are the key things to get right from that employment law site? Yeah, so I mean, I completely agree with you. I represent a lot of employers, but also a lot of employees. And a lot of those employees are re requesting either permanent remote work or flexible models. Um, the distinction first and foremost needs to be made between being a remote worker and being a nomad. So, you know, the, the legal implications change drastically. Typically, a remote worker is working within the jurisdiction of their employer and a digital nomad is working outside of the jurisdiction of their employer. Some of the key safeguards that you need to have in place is obviously enforceable agreements. So that's a remote employment agreement or a remote independent contractor agreement. Again, as I mentioned, the court is not concerned with whether or not the agreement says on its heading that it's an independent contractor relationship or an employment relationship. They're concerned with are, what are the factors that are present here that indicate whether or not it's one or the other. Um, so having those agreements in place that have been vetted by a lawyer, such as me or, or my firm, um, is step number one. Step number two, obviously dealing with the health and safety requirements of uh of the workplace and of the jurisdiction. And then step number three is the tax obligations. From a broader scale, I think it's more important to consider how the relationship is going to function in the long term. So when you're dealing with a nomad in the long term, you want to be dealing with that nomad in a freelance or independent contractor relationship because the tax obligations become very complicated. And it's not as simple as simply paying the taxes where the employee is located. And it's also not as simple as simply paying the taxes in your home location as an employer if the employee is in a different country. Because oftentimes, if the employer has been domiciled in a country for a number of days, sometimes the key number is 183, that employee all of a sudden has to be paying taxes in that jurisdiction. So there's a lot more at play. And really, the rule of thumb is to make them a freelancer. Now, I want to add, and everyone should know, that there are global solutions. Employers of record, global employers of record, EORs, are a fantastic solution to hiring employees in different jurisdictions. Employers of record, for anyone in the audience that doesn't know what they are, they essentially employ the employee and they deal with all of the HR, all of the accountant, all of the employment legislation to, uh, to, to deal with that employee. And they basically send them out as an independent contractor to you, the employer. Um, so you don't have to worry about any of those things. The caution again that uh, I give to all of my employer clients that are working with these EORs is really, again, look at those factors. What's indica indicative of an independent contractor, a true independent contractor relationship? And what's indicative of the employment relationship? You've, you've, so yeah, again, you've hit the nail on the head, Tara. What we've seen so far in the market is basically employers of record are if you think of like that whole compliance side as, as a pie, they're excellent at the employment law and yeah. social security side of it uh, and, and income taxes. Absolutely fantastic. But the challenge of work money is it triggers, for example, corporation tax, what's called permanent establishment risk. They yeah. don't cover you for that at all. So having, you know, making sure you got that side of it covered is really critical because you can actually send somebody who's a senior director or, for example, if they're in a sales generating role, if you put them through an EOR abroad and they trigger permanent establishment, well, that country can actually technically get a some of the percentage of the corporation tax profits. So it's a, it's a, like you said, it's a multitude of different risks. You've got to make sure you have them all covered, but that's absolutely fascinating. I think when the employers of record, you can see the growth that they're having, yeah. that they're a critical part of the solution. Um, one of the things, uh, Kieran, as well, I saw recently was a Microsoft study. Uh, they did a study in the last week that said that remote work threatens the company's innovation. I wanted to get your own thoughts on that. And, 
you know, how does co-working spaces either aid or hinder a, a company's innovation capability? And maybe for background, the reason they were saying it is because the teams weren't getting to meet up in person or weren't there weren't these, uh, you know, these little idiosyncratic catch-ups that people might meet in a coffee uh, beside the coffee machine or whatnot. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, first of all, look, Tara and you are serious experts. You know, I think myself and Dave are listening to you going, what is going on? <laughs> so, wow, great insight into the, the tax and the legal side. Uh, so thanks for sharing that. No, you, listen, John, I, I think it's incredible. Like, I, I watched a video, um, Festive Road, are uh, one of the amazing consultancy firm in the business travel arena. Um, and they interviewed the head of business travel for Microsoft, a gentleman called Eric Bailey. And it's you should find it on YouTube. Um, it's really, it's really interesting. And I think it it brings into question, I suppose, the world that we're we're living in. I think we like putting things into boxes, right? We like thinking of offices, we like thinking of workspaces and meeting rooms. But actually, there's a whole sort of mixture of of new needs now that are emerging. So yeah, like I think Microsoft. On that video, Eric shared that Microsoft have hired twenty five thousand people since COVID, wow. and does, that itself is mind boggling. And then you think none of them have met a colleague, right? So they're seeing a whole new way and a whole new kind of motivation for getting people together. You know, getting people together for um, innovation. Which is 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 critical. Uh, I, I see that in our company, you know, meeting to go through a marketing plan or or you know brainstorming. It's 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 difficult to do virtually, but also relationship building. Like you've just joined Microsoft, you know, you've you've gotten to know people virtually and absolutely, but you know, you don't have the same level of of sharing about your life story and your family and your you know your dog, you know. So it's those little discussions that build relationships and organizations, right? And and that's critical for all our careers. And especially if you're starting, I think Dave, you're spot on. It is different types of, you know, people. It, it, you know, if you're starting your career, you need to build a network. You need to build relationships, right? So, you know, th that's where the, the kind of the millennials and, and and Gen Z kind of segments are screaming for contact with people. They're just like a McKenzie report that came out recently really highlighted that like 15 million. Americans have left their jobs since April because a big driver is they haven't been able to meet anybody, connect, you know, it doesn't be, it's not be every day. We still want our freedom. We still want to work where we want to work and, you know, decide our, our schedule, but that contact is vital. So I think Microsoft have recognized it, you know, and they're smart too. And I think it brings into offsites, you know, team, team breaks where people go away for two days as a team. It can be, where you live, it can be in the city you're based in. It doesn't have to be necessarily international. All yeah. sites are going to be a huge area um, of of kind of significant growth in how we kind of connect with colleagues and and clients as well. So, uh, yeah, you can you can definitely see it even for companies that are fully remote like GitLab. They those offsites are absolutely critical for being you know fostering the glue of the company culture. So I'm going to shoot three really quick ones for you, Dave. I want your your uh, yes and no or whatnot on this. Uh, you got ten seconds for each answer. Um, and then we'll go to the final wrap-up question. So, Dave, what is it that real estate doesn't get about remote and that remote doesn't get about real estate? Real estate doesn't get that the future of work is not about offices. <laughs> and remote overvalues, or sorry, undervalues uh, uh, in-person interaction. Interesting. Uh, next one, what is the most exciting innovation that you're seeing in the real estate side? Um, I really think it's the, the wide scale adoption of platforms like Hubly. And I, I don't mean that like as a plug for Kiran, I just think that that gr the growth of those on demand platforms and the technology that can facilitate, um, managing the flow of people in and out of space and, and in the long term helping with space utilization. I think that those are critical to the, to the future of, of using offices. And last question, big cities are dead. Yes or no? Definitely not. Definitely, Definitely not. not. Excellent. I'll have to say, really, really enjoyed today's session. You know what? My own disappointment is I'd love to be speaking with this for the next few hours with you guys, but I can't. We've got to make do what we have, the time we have. I mean, I guess the last question I want to ask you all, and you've got a, you know, a minute to answer it all. Uh, we are at this inflection point in, in life and humanity in this work from anywhere world. I mean, that's that's for sure. 
what's your what's your your view of the thing that people are not talking about that we should be talking about more? So maybe Tara, you can kick us off there. What do the employees want? And this is me taking my legal hat off. What do the employees want versus what does the employer want? Still, even though there's been this push towards remote work, it has been through the lens of how the employer is going to operate. And absolutely, that needs to be considered. But once your employees are happy, and this is totally not my legal answer, but this is my human answer. Once your employees are satisfied, their work output is better, their loyalty is better, their autonomy is improved, their work-life balance is improved. That's it. Love it. Uh, Kieran, what's your view? What's something we should be talking about more about that we're not? We just have to stop waiting around and start doing it and, and, and start changing and, and get started. You know, start small and then learn, you know, refine and scale. But for me, that's the biggest thing. A lot of companies are talking about it and the strategies, but, you know, it's happening and it's time to get started. Lois, Dave, you, what do you think? Psychological safety. Psychological that's, safety. That is my answer fundamentally. Um, um, a lot of organizations out there are, are legacy. And when I say legacy, I mean they've been around for a long time. It doesn't mean that the business is like dying or anything. But the culture has evolved over this really, really long period and the world has changed around them like this fast, but they just don't know it. And so to me, going back to my earlier example of a tire, there are people out there that literally don't want to go into a workplace because they feel they cannot be themselves. So if we don't solve for that, like we got way bigger problems than space utilization and how the supply of commercial real estate yeah. needs to change. Absolutely love it. Thank you all so much. You've been a fantastic panel. My mind is buzzing. I could literally, I'd love us to get in a fireside chat and spend the next four hours talking about this and picking all your brains. Uh, but thank you all so much for coming on, sharing your perspectives. Karen, I'll see you for a beer in about two minutes. Nice to be face to face for once. <laughs> and in the meantime, guys, thanks a million. Really appreciate it. Looking forward to keeping in contact. Thank you for all the audience for yeah. being part of this. Really enjoyed it. Thanks for all your questions. Thank you. Thanks, John.